So just to give you an idea of a short form, the way it's played does not matter too much. What we want to remember is that it's made of the whole of a run, an animal in general, but preferably a run, and that we already have a run in that sacrifice story. If we were, that's how it's perfectly SH, and if we were to map the sounds obtained, the pictures obtained from that instrument, we do, uh, onto our diatonic system, and that's an equivalence, not an equality, we would have a fifth. Okay? I'm not saying this is a fifth, you've heard, it's very different, but mapping it on our diatonic, di diatonic system, it would be equivalent to. So we've got the short point in place, now let's talk about totemism itself proper. And we're not going to talk about totemism as we conceive of it today. We're going to talk about it as Freud and one of his collaborators called Theodor Reich talked about it, knew about it in their days. So basically we're replacing ourselves in their state of mind then. And the chap who wrote extensively in those days about totemism was a Scottish chap called George Fraser. 1854-1947, uh, he wrote the book and his book published in 1910 was called Totemism and Exogamy. So we're going to look at Could some of these exogamy. We're going to look at some of these definitions. Uh, Dimitri, please pick number one. Fraser 1, sorry. So, what do we have? That's a cover, the original cover. I always try to find original editions. You can find them on the Google Books or Google Scholar. Yeah. It's very useful to go back to the actual vocabulary, to the actual original editions. Uh, following picture, Fraser 2. So, a totem is a class of material objects okay, which a savage regards with superstitious respect, believing that there exists between him and every member of a class, and that's an important point, an intimate and altogether special relation. Uh, phrase number three, please. The totem is established by custom and the connection between a man and his totem is mutually beneficent. The totem protects, protects the man and the man shows his respect for the totem. Okay. Uh, phrase number four, please. Uh, Totemism is thus both a religious and a social system. And I'm putting the accent here on social system. I'll elaborate further about that. And, yeah, mutual respect and protection, and the relation, it also defines of the, rela the relations of the clansmen to each other and to men of other clans. So, this totem uh, story is in effect a metaphor. Just as there are animals which are different from one another, there are people who are also different from one another. And it creates a series by either similarities or oppositions. And these similarities and oppositions themselves are created by similarity or contiguity. So just as you have four-legged animals, you have four-legged humans, animals with two eyes, humans with two eyes. And what it does here, in this instance, is to regulate an, an ordered set into an ordered set. And then, therefore, we have history. 
we have a definition of what I have to do towards him and what he has to do towards me, what we have to do towards others who are outside the camp, what we have also to do towards the totem itself. So it's a way of regulating a history called becoming. And because it's a uh, kind of analogy or a metaphor of a cosmos, the totem is never allowed to die. Nobody, where, nobody knows where the idea of the totem comes from. And as such, it's creation ex nihilo, which is something we worked on this morning. Just appears. That's it. No question asked. You do it. And that's a very, very important aspect there. And there is an uh, enormous distinction with the fetish, which is also another anthropological um, concept. A fetish is a personal object, you can choose whatever you want. And it protects you, you don't have any particular duties, but it does protect you against bad luck. The totem is an entirely different category, it's either an animal or a vegetal. And most especially, you do not kill it, you do not eat it. So you can see where all these uh, stories about food prohibition as part of religion come from. Because the uh, prevailing opinion in those days was that there was religion first, and totemism was a derivation from religion. Fraser showed very conclusively that in fact we had totemism first, and it is all the uh, other religions which are derived from the totem. Now, the chap who did quite a lot of work in relation to totemism, anthropology, and psychoanalysis was called Theodor Wright. He was an early collaborator of Freud. He was part of the first generation of psychoanalysts. So he knew about his Judaism, he knew about his uh, music, musicology, and psychoanalysis as well. He wrote uh, a book about origin of totemism and also the origins of <coughs> rituals, origins and purposes of rituals, and most especially puberty rituals. If you remember, Isaac is a young lad, and he's going through puberty. And there's a particular reason why we have this young lad in that particular situation of a sacrifice. He also wrote extensively about the Shofar. So now I'm going to place myself, I'm going to pretend to be Reich, Theodore Reich, and I'm going to tell you what I came up with. This is not me speaking, this is Reich, yeah? all his arguments. So he first remarks that since uh, August AD 70, which was the destruction of the temple, which is. Yeah, uh, what did you say, 870? AD 70. Yes, yes. Yeah. Since the destruction. Second. Since the destruction of the temple, all instruments of music have disappeared except that shofar. Two, it has retained its simplicity. It's just a hole. There's no holes. There's no attempt to make it produce other types of sounds than the one it can produce. And of course, it only produces one sound. It's not a trumpet. Okay? The shofar is always curved, it's always an animal's horn, and it can be used to awaken the memory of a golden calf, the episode of the golden calf. And by the way, the expression golden calf is a mistranslation. It should be translated as a young bull. Again, we have an animal with horn. And that's the important point here. So, in Hebrew, we have two words for horn. One is keren, which has given the Latin cornu, which has given corn, corn in French, which is a horn. Which comes from the Akkadian cam. Okay. And it also has given us the word jobel. Jobel has given us the Latin for joy, which is joya, and which you also find in the English word jubilee. And we have in the Quran as jubal. And jubal. 
And the name of the instrument is therefore very close to the name of its inventor. And that's very important because, again, we have a horn. Everywhere we're looking, we have a horn, i.e. we have an animal, i.e. we have totemism. Wherever you have an animal, you have totemism. Simple as that. Think of drums. We've got war with. Skin of an animal. Yeah. Now, the Chopin sound itself is, has several associations. And that's still right speaking, by the way. It can be a signal of danger. It can be a sound to terrify the enemy. Jericho trumpets, for instance. It's uh, a signal that it is New Year's Day and a day of atonement of sin within the Judaic religion. It signals Judgment Day. Think of uh, the Requiem Mass, which is a particular format in music, and you have a part which is called Tuba Mirae. Tuba, of course, is a wind instrument, the horn. And it is indeed Judgment Day as part of the Requiem Mass celebration. The Monarch Coronation. Trumpet in classical music has always been associated with royalty. In the Hollywood films, when the king arrives, the queen arrives, they are blowing trumpets. This is not an invention from Hollywood, this is a tradition. It can be used to signal an excommunication. When Spinoza was excommunicated, they uh, blew the shofar back in 1656. Remember that Lacan identified himself quite strongly with Spinoza. It is used to show repentance, remembrance, and hope. It can be used to announce the coming of the Messiah, the Messiah. We haven't heard that sound in relation to the coming of the Messiah because as far as Judaism is concerned, the Messiah has not arrived yet. It's part of the sacrifice of Isaac. We've got that, we had that little ram hiding a corner. It's used for VIP's funerals. It's also a means of assuaging God, and it's also a means to confuse the devil. Nowadays, all that has changed, and it's really <coughs> confined to the religious sphere. And its religious purpose is to obtain God's mercy, and also, again, to confuse Satan. And that's all part of Jewish mysticism of the 17th and 18th century. Now, uh, pick Exodus 19, please, in the big photograph. In this little text, Reich noticed something very, very, very strange, a contradiction. If... Yeah, could you read out the passages in yellow, please? Yeah, the three passages in yellow. That ye, that ye go not up into the mount, nor touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. The voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, and when the voice of the trumpet sounded long, and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. There is a contradiction, sorry, contradiction in this text, which is noted by Reich, which is trying to uh, elaborate, to uh, elucidate. We have a trumpet which is sounding very loud, but at the same time, uh, we can hear God's voice. There is some kind of confusion there. And Reich proposes that it can be resolved if we agree that God's voice and the sound of a trumpet are the same. So, the shofar, the sound of the shofar, is also God's voice. So we're getting God very close to that little rum business. So, Moses plus God 
plus the horn, plus the people, they see the mountain, but they are forbidden to approach it. Only Moses could actually climb the mountain. So again, we have a uh, taboo. We have an interdiction concerning something which has to do with origin, something which has to do with the sacred, something which has to do with the divine. Now, we could ask ourselves why uh, is the shofar made of a rhyme's hall? The fact is, throughout the ancient East, we have horned gods everywhere. Absolutely everywhere, both in depictions, on tablets, and in texts as well, metaphors. The horn is, in an agricultural society, an obvious symbol of strength. That's why we have this horn business. And that's present in both Judaism and Christianity as well. But you also have uh, in uh, Hellenistic Greek, uh, Greece, ancient Hellenistic Greece, gods worshipped as bull or ram. Di think of Dionysus, for instance. He's always de depicted with a horn of some kind. Uh, can we have a picture etymology horn? If we look at the etymology of the word itself. So, uh, emblem of power, courage, strength, might. Bacchus as a giver of courage, always represented with horns. Yeah. Also, something which was pointed out to me by Julia Evans was that in order to get those horns out of an animal's head, you have yourself to be strong. So, again, strength potency are involved in this whole business. Therefore, it is not surprising that we have the ram as a totem, and it draws its special holiness as an expiatory sacrifice for gifts. This is why also we have uh, in earlier demon cult, which were quite uh, widely spread in the ancient East, uh, as the devil. And that's why the devil has got horns as well. Again, this is Reich talking, not me. You have priests wearing horns, wearing animal skin, wearing animal masks as part of their ceremonies. But not by accident. Here we have an identification with the deity, because the deity is an animal, a ram. You're going to try to look like, to pretend that you are the divinity itself. So think where this uh, business of hats come from. The business of crowns. Why do monarchs wear crowns? It's a metaphor. So we have an identification with an animal, as well as the sound it makes. And you can imitate those sounds with your hands, blowing inside your hands for instance, or with particular instruments and tools. Right, so this is no more right, this is me again back. So, so far, any questions, any comments? We have a run, we have horns, we have sacrifice, we have divinity, we have monarchs. Well, yeah. um, I think that um, isn't it right in the interpretation of dreams, Freud often finds that there's a correlation between animals and genitals. And another thought that occurs to me is that the ram's horn, of course, is curved. And being curved, you could say that it is not just phallic, but ethy phallic, very, very phallic. If it's very, very phallic, it not, not only asserts sexuality, it also declares an unconscious fear of castration. You wouldn't insist on it unless you were afraid of being castrated. And um, the ability of a totem to uh, hold together a whole group seems like an association with the superego, which Freud felt was built on the ashes of the Oedipus complex. In other words, one interjected one's parents as an object 
as soon as the Oedipus complex was um, dis uh, dissolved. One hundred percent yes. Uh, there is identity between superego and totemism. You just need to go back to the uh, actual text, and in fact, I'm coming to the uh, to a particular text, totem and taboo. Which do you want to say something? Yeah, something interesting, which is the this on the uh, uh, history, not the oldest text we have. Now the oldest uh, uh, animal that was born as as you know was born by a priest called Adapa in Sumeria, and it was a fish that he wore. He had the fish head on it, and the fish ran down. He wore it on his head. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. And this fish had its mouth open, which is a symbol that we found onto the two last popes had. You know, when they had this 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 special hat on their heads, which is definitely the the uh, uh, same thing as the mouth of the fish in question, and of course all the relationship to Christianity and, and the fish and so forth. And it's a bit later in the text that we find really the horn appearing. So the first guy was Adapa, he was the fish, and they said in these ancient texts, we speak in about 3,200 BC there. That uh, he, uh, the old knowledge came from the sea. Just a remark on uh, Bessel. Intersection between archaeomusicology, anthropology, psychoanalysis, musicology. Yeah. Right. Uh, yes, so superego, totemism, of course, it brings us to the 1905 te uh, 1913 text by Freud, Totem and Tabu. Who's read Totem and Tabu? Okay. <laughs> uh, Totem and Tabu. Sorry? Just about. Oh, that's good. That's just as good. Just as well. Totem and Tabu is the story of the so called primitive, the uh, father of a primitive horde, which I'm sure you've heard. Yeah. And its concept Freud took from Darwin. Many, 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 many thousands of years ago, mythical time, we had this father who was very strong, all powerful, and he ruled his tribe with an iron fist. And most especially, he kept for himself all the women. So the sons had solo. They got fed up with this, and they killed him. And not only they killed him, they ate him. Eat, this is my body, drink, this is my blood. Okay? And what happened afterwards is remorse sets in among the sons. So they make several decisions. One, never again will there be an all-powerful father. Two, we will share everything and we will share the woman. Three, in order for this situation not to arise again, we're going to go on the road in other villages, meeting up with other tribes and taking their woman. Four or five, to make sure again it does not happen again, we get to celebrate regularly this, uh, this crime and the celebration will take the form of a communal meal so that we will remember what we did and we'll never do it again. This is Freud's way of explaining the setting up of the superego. That's his limits. He does what he can. And by setting up a superego, you make sure to respect the laws of your tribes, the laws of your society. Otherwise, the dead father <laughs> is going to come back. And in effect, that father is even more loved once he's dead, and is even more powerful once he's dead. That's why a father, in a way, has to be dead, to be really effective. 
not really dead, but he has to accept to be overtaken. Has to accept to... To be overtaken. And here we are in this generation, trans-generation business. But yes, it's part of the setting up of a superego, which concludes the uh, passage through the Oedipus complex. So remorse brings obedience and it brings love, it brings respect. And by reenacting through a communal meal this whole business, not only do we share and die with the guilt, we also make sure it does not happen again. And this is what happens when a shofar is being blown. You've heard a sound, it's not very good quality sound we heard, but the sound of a shofar is very low and it's very grating. Like that. And of course that's a male voice. And that daddy, that's a reminder that daddy is there watching you. Just like a superhero. Yeah. Awakening of guilty conscience, awakening of subsequent, subsequent remorse. And therefore, the short part sound, as pointed out by Wright in this uh, business of a uh, conversation in Azai, is the cry, the sound of God, and as such, it is the cry of a father when he was being murdered. Because it doesn't go quietly. And that's why you've got a kind of sonic proximity to a bull, for instance, then killed. And if you kill a ram, you kill a bull, you get all of the horns. That's your proof, that's your victory over the father, to remind you that you killed the father. Okay? So, by imitating this role, as in uh, ceremonies, for instance, ritual ceremonies, you invoke the presence of God, which is what happens in Babylonian music, on the lyre, when you strike a particular string, you evoke the presence of a God associated with that string. In Baroque classical music, uh, Bach, for instance, the idea of choirs inside the church is to bring the presence of the divinity into the church itself so, you can, so that you can feel its presence. Uh, the shofar indeed has some kind of sexual connotations that's reflected in vocabulary, pointed out uh, in the interpretation of dreams, and is confirmed in the psychological clinic. No problem there. This is where we have now we can draw a kind of relationship between music and totemism. Wright contends that music was invented, and again, all the proviso I've outlined about this word music, but it was invented to cover the cries of a father being murdered. Therefore, whenever you are playing music, it is a reminder of that murdering scene, but it is also a reminder of this superego business. It's to remind you that you are inside limits, and those limits are guaranteed by the effect of this dead father. Relationship between music sound and eroticism, love ballads, that's the most <laughs> popular form of music once secular music started developing, talking about love. Pop music, the most popular form of the love ballads. If you're old enough, you may remember um, a black American artist called Barry White. Yes. <laughs> Would you like to describe Barry White for those? Well, he's like sort of libido on legs, really. <laughs> <laughs> you say, uh, some people, it doesn't kind of link necessarily with any kind of uh, sexuality issue specifically. It's nothing to do with uh, heterosexuality, homosexuality, bisexuality. It's just that some people seem to ooze a kind of effortless um, libido sexuality. And it's almost as though they are the planet Jupiter. They, they have this kind of gravity. And once you're in that uh, orbit, you're, you're in that orbit. 
Um, similarly, it's like, well, this is, I suppose, the diametrical opposite. There are people who exude an absolute goodness. And if that was said, for example, of, of uh, uh, Mother Teresa, so that if you're in her presence, it again, it was like you were in the presence of a celestial body, I mean heavenly, but a celestial body like a star, like a huge planet, there's a, a sort of gravity that pulls you towards them, and it's ineluctable, you can't escape it. Sorry, that was a digression. <laughs> there's, a, there's another thing about music and sexuality. Uh, one of the, uh, of the texts that we've been working on recently uh, says of uh, Zhu who is, I think it was Zhu who was Inanna's lover. He says, may my sperm be as abundant as the river Euphrates and my penis be as tight as the string of your heart. So there's a relationship mm. uh, again there. And consider the contemporary phenomenon of waves, it's called. It's big, party, lots of music, lots of drugs, lots of drinks in the open air. And these are a way for young people to, to come out, socialize, as called. Okay. Going back to the sound of the shofar, when we sound the shofar, what happens? God is resurrected but as a forgiving God. That's very important. He will help if you, if us, Lord, the sons, will renounce hostility. Super ego, again. It allows, therefore, an acting out, uh, a kind of compromise for, uh, formation, a weakened metonymy of an initial impulse, that is, a discharge of libido. So we can have bad thoughts. That's okay. As long as we atone for them with our brothers and sisters, all the other sons and daughters, together as part of a community, with the sound of a shofar. That's what we go to Mass for. To atone for our sins. That's why we go to confession. That's why we've got best friends to atone for our bad thoughts. That's why we've got uh, the excommunication of Judgment Day, because God's voice is a threat of death. A threat. It's not death itself, but a threat of death. And again, we are inside that superego business. Oh, something, when was it? About um, four years ago? When was the last Jubilee? 2011? It is not sure what's that. That was very long ago. It's only a few years, years, isn't it? Okay, <laughs> not very long ago. But Queen Elizabeth uh, made a pledge in public that she would keep her subjects going. And that's what used to happen in uh, Pharaonic days in ancient Egypt. Pharaoh was the engine of everything. Every year, he would pledge to keep his rule and his realm and his subjects together. Yeah? That was part of the ceremony on the Nile. And what does the queen do during her jubilee? She goes down the Thames on a boat. And she makes a public pledge. Okay? Nothing new here. That's why we have also the myth in relation to the dead father, the myth of the rebellious song as the inventor of arts and sciences. That's why, therefore, we've got also exogamy. That's why we've got the taboo on incest. You don't touch the woman of your tribe. You go and get women from another tribe. By doing that, you travel. You exchange goods, you exchange ideas, exogen. Yeah. That's why we can consider music as an imitation of a paternal voice. Through the imitation of sounds of animals, which animals are themselves worshipped as totem. So, what was happening in that painting, of, uh, in that story of uh, Abraham and Isaac? Why would Abraham wanted to kill his son. The obvious reason is God told him to do that. Let's go a little bit behind that. 
actually. And White contends that Abraham, as a father, knew very well what his teenage son was about to do, because he himself, when he was a teenager, was thinking about doing the same, which is to replace his own father. So he tried to prevent what was happening. Wright also contends that circumcision is a way to tell the youth, <laughs> watch out, <laughs> don't even think about it. It's a kind of punishment warning before the fact. Because when you're a teenager, <laughs> you want to take that place. As simple as that. You want to own his boots, you want to take his car, you want to take all his possessions, or whatever. And you're warned. Limits are being put into place. Because you yourself, you know very well, as a father, <laughs> what you were like at that age. So that's what right contents here. Does that make sense? It, it does. Can, can I say something yep. specifically musical about the interval of the fifth? Yeah. Okay, see on the board there you've written the C and the G. Don't start, Richard, don't read on the interval of the fifth, please, otherwise we're going to be here for okay. the next ten years. <laughs> really? Should I not? I do, do well, it. Let, let, I want to let, shut up. Let me say a couple of things. If you sound a note on the piano, or a note on the violin, or on any instrument, really, um, the note you hear is not the only note that is happening. There is a set of subliminal pitches happening. The first pitch that is other than the note that you are hearing is an octave higher than that note. So it's the same denomination of note. If the note you're hearing is a C, the, the strongest whole major triad, and then that is circumvented into a minor triad. That is an immensely powerful moment in, that we know from the film 2001 Space Odyssey. Well, this is funny, a theory in practice is not the case. Because the instruments shouldn't enough people to have learned if you take the Rikashtaus and the others, yes. have instruments which give pitches which are in formal disagreements with the natural harmonics of the fundamental sound. But the, har the harmonic series can be easily demonstrated on a piano. I know, yeah, I know yeah, yeah, that it's not, yeah. I know it, it is, yes, it's an altered form of temperament. Yes, yes, but, uh, but, but the, those intervals, though, an octave, a fifth, yes. um, an out of tune third. So if we had an instrument that yes. represented it properly, then the, the interval would come up. Sorry, it's not it's not that it is. It's um, it's an octave, a fifth, the next octave or more, a major third, a minor yes. third, an out we of tune all, minor third. We are going to purely yes, musical yes, sorry, yeah. 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 I thought yeah. I thought. What, yeah. what do you mean by that? I could demonstrate it on that piano. It's, very, which it's a very weak yes. sound, which is in it's the background. It's a weak sound. So, I mean, it actually exists? Yes, it, yes, it does exist, exist. yes. It's it's not exactly. Here we are going to a purely musical <laughs> <laughs> yes, so yes, it is. So yes. to do that. Let's come back to our uh, it's much intersections. More <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, where was I? So, Religion, can we say, or totemism, allows for one, a separation from the totem, two, an alienation through exogamy. You have to forget about the separation, and that's exactly the field we have been here in, in, in Seminar 7, exploring the concept of das Ding. Alienation, separation. Um, those of you who are Lacanians would find more elaboration by both Miller and Law about these two concepts. Huh? So you have an original content, that content is repressed, that folks, but it does keep its original quantum of libido. That's why you put to the tone for it. You find another representation, you do the displacement. So <coughs> From father we go to totem, from dead father we go to totem, we go to religion, we go to music, we go to art, science, tragedy. And remember that Freud considered that the Oedipus complex is actually the nucleus of the birth of tragedy and the arts. It's got to be in place first. In Christianity we have the 
crucifixion, so the father this time kills the son, and all it is, is a reversal of the son killing the father, which is a very usual thing to find in uh, psychoanalysis. And that son is reborn through death, but he's reborn with the father, and he ends up sitting at his right, so he shares in the power. So in effect, the son has realized his wish, but in a, display, in a displaced way. He does not replace God, he does not replace the father, but he shares with the power of the father. And this is again what this superhero business or Oedipus complex is about. In morning rituals, you have lamentations, howlings. In fact, they are compulsive, obligatory, or wise. You accuse of not caring. And what's that for? It's to cover up the triumph of having overcome the father. So, making animal sounds by blowing your fist, for instance, or shrieking, that's <coughs> Chopin song. Hence, the importance of music and dance in religious rituals. Vatican II reintroduced music at the Mass. There's the Council of Trance, 1466 or 1366, I'm not sure. Music was something terribly licentious. You did not have music at Mass. Vatican II reintroduces that. So, in this part of the world, in the West, the prototype of the feast is Dionysus from the Hellenistic uh, culture, and it's basically a funeral rite of the Son of God. And dance can be considered a form, and again, I'm st but still right talking, dance can be considered as the expression of a triumph of having killed the Father. Think of young children's reaction when they get what they really like. You give them sweet, they ask for a sweet, and they get a sweet, or you announce them with the entree. This never. A lot of joy, a lot of dancing around, moving around. Okay? Right, so this is the end of Reich. What do you think? Dance as an expression of triumph over the father. So dance. 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 For instance. Right. This whole business of overcoming the father, of killing the father, of taking his place. Is this what we still have in our contemporary societies? That one would imagine there's an awful lot of kind of primal urges that are there in primitive man are simply sublimated in uh, um, our modern culture. What a, lot of, a lot of mass culture, I think, must be. What's the clean current way of killing the father? It's very clean, very humane. Democratic elections. <laughs> right? It's a good way. So, let's try to elaborate a little bit further because that story of killing the father, of a father of a primitive hold, keeping a woman for himself, it's a little bit uh, of a tall story. But that's all we could come up with in those days. So let's try to come up with something ourselves. Okay. Sorry, it's, Joe. It's all from a very adult perspective. Father, mother. You have to know. How old was Hans, little Hans? <laughs> it was five. Exactly. Yeah, but I mean, what about exactly. three, five? You're pre Oedipus at three. Yeah. And, and one knows that babies recognize music. Do they? Yeah, when they... Apparently they babies can hear sounds in the womb. Yes, and then they, they can but sounds create certain tunes with mom. What did they explain about this word music? Well, you said it only came into existence. Okay, yeah, in when the 12th well, when we, when we use the word music, we refer to a very specific system which is organized, okay. very structured, very hierarchical. Yes. A baby cannot recognize that yet. They can recognize tunes. 
It's yeah. amazing how much communication the music is unconscious. Amazing. It's a remarkable thing that, that at any rate I've, I've found in, in my work as a musicologist how um, structures that are there in music that are very complicated structures, they may, may be counterpoint, they may be invertible counterpoint, they may be inversions of melodies, they seem to convey something absolutely straight away to the person without the person being able to say, I know that's a retrograde inversion of that tune. That is fascinating to me because I can't explain that. I, I would be inclined to agree with what you said. You wouldn't imagine that cognitively you would be able to make a connection and yet people do. And they do it repeatedly and demonstrate, you know, a lot of music wouldn't exist unless it said something. But not, and, a, not at baby stage. Not at baby yeah. stage. I don't know. Which is which was Joe's point. Yeah. You see, I think I think babies, for example, a baby in the womb can hear if its mother sings, can hear if its father sings to it, as you know, more loving kind of talk. It, it can differentiate the voices, yes. Yeah. But I'm contending yeah. it will not be able to recognize whether it's a one five one. No. Well, it, I presume yeah. it wouldn't do that. Exactly. Yeah. So but it would, in the for domain. example, the, the, the incessant beat in a pop piece of music, the boom, 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 in, in a pop piece, is the mother's heartbeat. It is the mother's heartbeat. It is the sense of security. Think how secure you feel when you hear a pop piece of pop music that does that. Well, you might think that's too primitive to have any kind of moving effect at all. And it is very moving, but it brings you back to the womb. A very interesting point, but I contend it is not, because the boom, 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 the one, two, three, four, the kick of pop music is extremely regular and has the same volume, which is not the case with the whole beat. The whole beat is strongly differentiated. Uh, system. Yes, but you know, it's not. Yeah. Ah, get very complex yeah. rhythms, irregular yeah. rhythms. Exactly, whereas the rhythm of pop music is extremely always regular, mercy for, uh, without mercy. It's one, two, three, four, it's a machine, basically. <laughs> There's no deviation, nothing whatsoever. Yeah. And the whole beat, the human heart beat is extremely different. Okay. Then, if an analogy is constructed between the kick of pop music and the whole beat, but something else altogether. Yeah, but that, that puts in place an appreciation of rhythm, interval, breaks, you know, according to what the mom's heart does. I'm just arguing for the sake of it. You know, so that is already putting into place something before they know about um, that frightening dad out there. I'm saying the fetus is autistic, actually. You're, you're saying? The fetus is autistic. It's a closed system. So you would accept what um, Winnicott says, that the idea of an interaction between the baby and the mother is an illusion of the psychologists? It's, uh, it's in the Lacanian category of the imaginary. You see, it's so difficult to know what the answer is on that. I mean, as you know, the Kleinians believe that the ego is there from birth in a, in a kind of rudimentary form. It's one of those things that <laughs> I, I personally don't think there's any real answer to that. Yeah, no, I know. Um, psychologists, have, uh, developmental psychologists, have found that the baby responds to the contours in the mother's voice, um, and later puts meaning on it. But there, there is a kind of language there from the start. Okay, the psychologists go and study the real. Yeah? yeah. Which we always going to react <laughs> to the design of a psychologist to create an imaginary, <laughs> which is the result of your study. Never discount the design of a scientist, the one who makes the experiment. So you're saying that the ego of the scientist gets in the way of the mm, perception? Not the ego, the sympathy of the, the design of, the, uh, of a psychologist. Yeah. Right. Uh, Never yeah, discount you're being a bit tough. Uh, <laughs> I'm not Lacan is. <laughs> no, because look, when I'm watching you, give your presentation, yeah. your full body language, I can see the intensity of your expression, and the, you know, how your voice fades, comes and goes. To me, that's like, it's quite musical. You know, there's a fluidity, there's a continuity, there are breaks. You're and all of that goes into music. 
You in my design at that point. You accept to be in my design. I'm listening. And what? You accept to be in my design because my design is indeed to be musical, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And if you find that enjoyable, it's because you accept to be in that yeah, my and design. And like the infant would be, and wanting to find out what the mother's desire is. As per the Lacanian text, there is always a trans transitivity, there is always a third term, and the third term is the desire of the one who sets up the sea. Okay. Otherwise, the Lacanian text collapses, and the Freudian text collapses, if you forget about that. <laughs> because that desire, the symbolic, that's libido, you're being captured in the field of libido. Yes. <laughs> Interesting. I'm not sure I'm convinced by that. I, I, I have to cry out of it in the sense that Let's elaborate. Let's elaborate. I'm a musicologist and not an analyst. But I mean, all of those. Um, but we are in the intersection. Oh yes, yes, yes. Between psychology yes. and musicology, which That's is how right. uh, we actually met at yes, a yes. conference on uh, sure. music and uh, psychology. True. True. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm like a bicyclist, you see, I can go on the pavement instead of the road. Ah. <laughs> right, so, we have a story which is a little bit of a tall story, but that's all we could elaborate. So let's try to elaborate something, and I'm going to propose a couple of things. First, we look at that story of the uh, killing of this terrible father. And let's extract the main lines to see what it consists of. Something terrible happened at some point. Something so terrible that it had to be forgotten and then covered up. Hence the invention of music. Now we've been talking about fetuses and let's talk about fetus again. And I said earlier on, a fetus is a self-contained system, it's autistic. A fetus does not need to eat. Nutrients are brought to it directly via the placenta. Two, a fetus does not need to breathe. Oxygen is brought to it directly via the placenta. So, what's the first thing which happens when that fetus pops out? Exactly. The autonomy, uh, autonomous breathing system kicks into place for the very first time <coughs> in its life, that fetus, which is now a baby, is confronted to an outside. It is invaded by an outside. Its narcissistic sphere is punched up for the very first time. Freud refers to it as an impressive caesura in the link with the mother. There you go. Therefore, that's why your baby is crying so much. And in effect, if it's not crying, there's something wrong. That's why uh, a midwife might give it a tap to actually make the lungs function for the very first time. That cry is a manifestation of what I can call jouissance. Jouissance is a lot of unpleasant pleasure. This is your first experience of a huge amount of jouissance. That cry becomes inscribed in the psyche ball, including all the sensations you experience then. It may become impressed, you may not be able to remember, but it's there. And I'm proposing, therefore, that music was invented to cover up, as well as remember, that terrible first experience of the world by drawing on white story of uh, music to cover the cries of the father. Something terrible happened, something so terrible of such uh, import that it has to be forgotten because it's too painful to remember. Okay? That's my first elaboration. By extension, we can see music as a screen or a defense. Before that, that's become 
Where does the uh, finches come from? What do you mean, where does it come from? Where does the fetus come from? <laughs> There's so many ways of answering that. It's, uh, it's quite a heavy question. <laughs> I'm therefore a single interpretation. Elaboration is music as a screen or the defense against what I call the real without love. Jouissance is the real, by the way. The real is the Latin category, RSI, yeah? Real symbolic imaginary. A real without love. The real is always without love. There is no rhyme, no reason to the real. When uh, the Somerset levels planes get flooded, that's the real. Jouissance is the real. is crying out to something outside it. It doesn't know that there's anything outside it. It could, it could be a communication. Not yet. We're talking about the very first moment of that very first intake of breath. We have an entirely different situation before we're in a sphere and from the moment of birth, we are in a torus because there is a hole in that sphere. There is a wheel there. So the hole is really the world, or the ego's foremost connection with the world. And I know that the image of the torus is that there is the paradox that there is a hole in the middle of it. Um, and there must be something paradoxically uh, linking the individual through that, through that hole, through that nothing. There is a possibility of potential, yes, but object relation is not yet there. Okay. Yep. Can you just explain that bit about the first breath of being the, um, the unpleasure of pleasure? No, the, uh, I said the very first breath is a very nasty, unpleasurable experience of pleasure, i.e. jouissance. An unpleasurable experience of pleasure. Yes. There, there, there is I an explanation. There is a poetic explanation. So, it's in other words, because Lacan, although he's not as difficult to understand as Mrs. Klein, can be a little bit difficult to read. But Thomas Hood, the poet, uh, in the early 19th century, wrote in his poem, Ode to Melancholy, brightest light throws sternest shade there is even that happiness that can be afraid. It's where happiness is so vast that it somehow threatens the individual, it overwhelms the individual. There is a connotation of that in this concept of jouissance. Jouissance is an enorm enormous amount of pleasure. And the thing is that <laughs> It's not the fact that the more pleasure you get, the more enjoyable it is. There is, at some point, it tips over, it hurts. If you gradually increase your intake of pleasure, eventually it hurts. And that's why we have this category of results. That's why you go in analysis for. <laughs> because you've got so much pleasure with all your symptoms. <laughs> and it becomes unbearable because that pleasure is an enigma, in fact. C can I suggest something to do with, again, this music? It may be a, a bridging point between what you're saying about the baby and what Bruno is saying about the baby. And it is the phenomenon that arises from this fascinating thing. I'm sure everybody in this room, when they've heard a piece of music, unless just possibly it's medieval period music, or unless it's very early Renaissance music, they kind of know when the piece is about to finish. Has everyone felt that? Not medieval, unless you've heard medieval before. That's what I meant. Yeah. I not, not medieval, yeah. That's okay. excluding, yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's excluding yeah. medieval. Yeah. Medieval is not yet yeah. organized yeah. enough yeah. to do it, that. It's sort of, it's, there's a, a certain 
search for wholeness, completeness, uh -huh. or, or I, anticipating the complete. I disagree that the, the hurry in the is dating from 1004 BC. Yeah. In use there's no doubt. So it's a concept which is far more ancient. Do you, know, do you know that that's coming, though? As a listener, can you perceive it? Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, uh, as, as a trained trained listener, listener. As a trained listener. Yeah. Then I think one has to say it's a trained listener. But I think, I think, no, 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 I mean, I, I've, uh, I've had it, uh, I mean, the, structurally, it's in, you know, it's, you cannot afford it. No, no, no. On, on the audition of a person, yes, I mean, I, I've experienced this in the non-musical audience, right. Right. which was for, in the Mass Does everyone with, know Ravel's Bellero? Well, yes, it is the worst piece he ever wrote. Okay, you could, you could argue. <laughs> you can't ask not even, I know, the aesthetics of it, I'm not worried about it. He takes a tune and a rhythm, and it repeats and repeats and repeats and repeats, as the poor fetus inside the, the mother repeatedly hears the mother's internal body sounds, because it does have an ear. It can hear them. It hears heartbeats and, and feel them, and it, it can hear heartbeats, even if they're irregular or not regular. Ravel's Bolero is like a piece that goes on mother's body sounds, mother's body sounds, mother's body sounds, mother's body sounds, wham! At the end of the piece, the tune is presented for about, what is it, half a minute? In a different key. Well, you remember that moment at the end, it goes wham into a different key. The very first time you hear it. Not for much less than half a minute, it's a diminished seven. Yes. There's a diminished seven there, isn't there? It's a diminished yes. seven four. The entire piece is a melody, well, yeah. suddenly you have a diminished seven four, and that's it, and then you've got your back to the tonic. Okay, we're back into musicology again. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And but that, that said, but even if it's a diminished seventh, yeah. and by the way, there are antecedents for that in Baroque period music, because a diminished seventh on the sharp and fourth step in a minor scale is a very frequent characteristic of, of high Baroque music as a valedictory gesture. So if a valedictory gesture is something entirely new, it could be jouissance, as Lacan would call it, or it could be what Hood meant by this brightness that is so great that it casts a terrifying dark. I can't go there with you. Um, there is a form uh, in what we nowadays call music. Let's start from Bach. Let's start with Bach. There is a form. That form is 151, as outlined by Schenker. That's a consequence, a logical consequence of the way Contrapunt is organized, okay? No. One, five, one. One, five, one. The, the, the tonic chord, the dominant chord, and the tonic chord. It's, it's the sort of basic framework of, of yeah. music. It was much elaborated after then, and one yeah. could say that Schenker did oversimplify. I don't necessarily disagree. Okay. I think 151 is, is, is certainly the basis. But here is what happens, yeah? This is historical. This is something we've seen this morning. This is historical. 151, one. you have a repeat of 1 there. But it's not the same one as this one because you've changed by then. Yes, of course. The psychical yeah. system is an entirely different state when it receives this. That's right. And what happens when you hear this? J'ai plus de j'ai plus de place. What happens is exactly the same as what happens with uh, the graph on the graph of desire. You have an enunciation. Uh, Sorry, the opposite direction. You have an enunciation. Once the enunciation is finished, retroactively, meaning is created. That's for speech. You need to hear the last word. Yes. To know what I mean. And that's retroactive. This is what it also happens in music, in Western music. Once you've got your second one, you can yeah. then say retroactively, ah, it was a piece of music. I think you oh. can say it before then. You can say it before then. But I agree that the 151 is like subject in a sentence, grammatically, verb and object. So the verb. Well, there is a saying, you know the, oh, the, um, the architect, whose name I'm at the moment, was an architect, very famous one in the 60s, who said, God is a verb. If God is a verb, it's because he takes the subject through to the object. God is a DJ, name of a 
very well the great track from the early 2000s. Uh, that's that's that what they say. God is a DJ. Right. Give me three this morning, you said music is a language. Music is a language. Let's go into that. I'm saying yes and no. Yes, it's a language in the general sense, meaning of language, but it does not have a signified. And that's a big difference with ordinary normal language. It has no signified. Music has no signified. Yeah. Uh, no, music, if you want to consider music as a language, you can, but you've got to remember it does not have a signified. Um, no, I, I can't go along with that. Go on. I think. Um, Musical expression can conjure up all kinds of. Afterwards, in itself, afterwards, I mean, in itself, it, uh, it does not okay. have so a signified. So, that, that retroactivity exactly. also applies to e art making. Exactly. You know, you have one gesture there. Exactly. You place it next to another one, the five, and then the two will go on to another one, which won't be the same. And that's why art is so pleasurable, because you are not obliged to make sense. You are freed from the tyranny of having and to make sense. It's a writing. It's more of a writing, and I think music is more like a writing. Yeah. Because it's not just a writing. And that artistic activity gives you access to deeper psychical source. Freud. Daydreaming, right hand daydreaming. When you don't have to make sense. Yeah. Just do whatever. There's a tremendous link between primary processing exactly. and music. You're closer and you're strong. Mm -hmm. Any artistic activity, you're much closer to the primary processes. And I would even say that there's a strong link between the dream work and day's residues and how a composer composes a piece of music. Here we have to touch on the fact that Freud said in the interpretation of dreams that with um, psychotic symbolism, psychotic imagery, there probably is a meaning, if only we could find it. Which is, uh, I think, an intriguing Well, point. then that depends on your use of the symbolic, doesn't it? You know, it might mean something to the psychotic person that yes. is completely different from how you might see it. Might do. Sure it's it's in the same way as if you're talking about a piece of artwork, yeah. rather than making it, yeah. you, you possibly come up with something different. Yes, it's exactly. great to get yeah. the same thing into the sure. isn't it? Sure. But half of it you would leave out in the same yeah. music, isn't it? There is not a which is, you, yes. know, you experience it rather than think about it. Structurally, we can agree there is no difference between the artistic process and the dream process. No, it's very right. close. It is very close. I I'm saying it's agree. the same. I'm, I'm, okay. Not close, but right. it's the same. Yeah. I, something about any kind of absolute makes. I think any absolute is only a nodal point. If I can put it in pro Freudian terms. So nodal points disintegrate, they look like absolutes. Okay. I wouldn't quite. I, I, I almost entirely agree with you. That's why, oh, that's, why, <laughs> that's why in music improvisation is possible. Yes, yes, yes. And I. The door improvising on the piano. And, 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 and you're dipping into diachrony. Yes. That diachrony, sorry. Yeah. I mean, two the layers of time. Area where there diachrony is the horizontal aspect of linguistics. It's a sewer. Diachrony is a Historic right. experience that right. isn't organised in a linear fashion. Yeah. So you're dipping into that. Um, you know, it's not even a collage, it's just these random connections that are different for different people. Each one of us. Yes. And yes. then we try and pull it out into a shared language. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, very quickly, last foray into musicology because not everyone here is a musicologist. <laughs> last foray, if you take your three to one descent from Schenker, that's your di that's your diachrony. Yeah. And all the notes in between, that's your diachrony. And the three itself is a synchrony, the two is a synchrony, and one is a synchrony. You're, you're doing the two forms, do you think? It's a very specialized musicology, yeah, it's musicology it's aspect. It's a way to look at a piece of music as a consequence of the way Western music works. Every piece will finish with those degree. Tom, tom. Um, three blind mice. Three blind mice. The, the tune of three yeah. blind mice 
Was Schenker argued, is spread over the whole structural panoply of a piece of music. I'm not sure I believe that. Have you done Schenker analysis? No, I tried. No. You? So maybe, tried. Maybe, I'm, maybe I'm ignorant, but I, every time I've encountered that, something makes me bristle. What is the interval between? There are degrees, okay? And okay. this is spread throughout a piece of music. Because and then you've got all the notes in between. Well, it's just those three notes because it, it seems to be vital to what you're saying. We, again, we don't want to go too much into we don't to music. Well, it's okay. Okay. Then we'll we'll go for later. Right. But anyway, this is the diachronic aspect of music. All the all, all the notes in between. It translates into color and you know. It might. It might. It might. Maybe we should do something. Uh, Devote an afternoon after Saturday yeah. morning to this particular aspect. Lowness, sorry, very old about low. low. Uh, another low. example. Low. What? Low one. Low one. Low one. Another example is when you on your own, there's silence. What you do, your first reaction is going to be to put some music on or the radio on to have something else to have some sound. Yeah. Silence Be can be music. Did you see said that? That's an aesthetics, that's imaginary. We are in the domain of imaginary. Oh, I'm concerned. I'm concerned with, I'm, I'm concerned with what happens when we're confronted with the real. Yeah. Okay. Yes, you can construct. Idea, okay. You construct an imaginary such as uh, there is music in silence. Exactly. But mm. yeah, that's there. Yeah. Initially, we want we are confronted to that. What's our reaction? We construct an aesthetics, or we put the radio on, we put some sound, or we put some music on. Right. Yeah. Because from silence, something could come up, something not so good. <laughs> at, at the end of Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony, the audience dare not applaud. They have been confronted with a musical journey that confronts something so deep and so frightening in each of us that we communally feel a great psychodynamic resistance and we dare not even make a sound. It finishes very, 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 very quietly, just very quietly. quietly. There's, there's the same as a mother, thief, symphony, the death in Venice. That's how it finishes as well. Yes. The instruction on the score is morendo, you're dying, as if dying. That's how you're instructed to play your strings. It, it is dying away. There are a number of specific musical processes. Again, I, want to, I won't go into it because it would be too technical. But too it, what? Too technical, too musically. Too. It would, it, it, something at the end of that symphony touches on, on something deeply frightening and visceral, and it doesn't shy away from it. And that phenomenon of not wanting to applaud is a fascinating thing because I suppose really the Pathetic Symphony is Jouissance, the third movement is Jouissance, and then the horror that lies beneath the Jouissance is the finale. What did you explore this morning? What did you explore this morning during our 707 reading? The barrier in front of desire? Because desire is too horrible to contemplate, we have to dress it up with uh, aesthetics. That's like all uh, similar the the of psychoanalysis. The, the envelope, exactly. The signifier, exactly. Yeah. Because under the skin, oh, we got the corpse. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Example of uh, the real without low PDFP which is called Music Covers Lowness Real in the PDF order. Most people got stuck in a plane because the plane got stuck on the tarmac. Hours and hours and hours, and it was hot. No information. The people got their little iPods, phones out, and they started playing music. Another example there. So that's why you've got the importance of a voice in pop music. 
the voice bear acting as object A. Because with object A you can cover the wheel and stick some knowledge, some explanation, which is always imaginary, of course, on the wheel. And of course, a second elaboration about the origin of music. Do you know the concept, the concept of the devouring mother? It's in Moses and Monfail, and it's just a little sentence at the end of the paragraph, and Freud doesn't explain anything at all, just puts it there. Where do we pop out from? From Mummy's womb. All of us, no exception. But, popping out, having popped out of the womb, <laughs> we have then to actually detach ourselves, gain our own freedom from our mother, i.e. from her field of results. It can be very difficult for mothers, also for fathers sometimes, to let go of their children as they grow up. There's always a tendency to be all-encompassing and always protecting. So, <laughs> what you have to do is to create a difference between yourself and the mother itself. And the acting agent normally in uh, that operation is what I could call initially the name of the father and then later on the names of the father i.e. this name of a father business acts as a cut. The father or whomever the figure is will tell the mother, the mother leave your child alone, <laughs> let him sort his apart, and he will also tell the child don't go back into the womb. It'd be so marvelous if you could go back into the womb, we wouldn't have to work, we wouldn't have to get up in the morning, we would have no problems, nothing, everything would be everything would be careful. No, we need that exogamy business in order to create society. So, in a way, music can be used for that as well to cover that detachment, to replace that detachment. It's a kind of a compensation. And what happens then? It's a way also to size or produce imaginary activities, imaginary in the Lacanian sense, yeah? activities, to create more symbolic, we create a dialectics between jouissance or the drive and the symbolic, and that itself allows the creation of new semiotic forms which go into the symbolic. We created motets in music, and then symphonies, then uh, requiem mass, then leader, etc. Et okay. And it attaches the tribe to what's permissible in any particular society, that is, an easily identifiable social code. For instance, you set up incest as being forbidden. You never have the expression incest in what it says on its own. You always have the taboo or the forbidding of incest. But right on the psychic level, you know, the this is about emerging into consciousness, isn't it? It's not remaining. You could put it like that. That's what Freud's way of. It's terrible yeah. when you say incest, but <laughs> this is what they mean. Merger. Freud used the concept category of incest that was the biggest impediment for him to a uh, civilization. Okay. Uh, let's try to elaborate on that, actually. We spent the last few months in 77 studying this thing called Das Ding, the thing. Getting stuck, what we saw is that getting stuck to Das Ding is also anti-civilization. So it would be the same, corresponding to Freud's incest. Um, feel free to elaborate on examples of what would be counterproductive 
to building the civilization. Going back into Mum's womb, which is a metaphor of incest, or incest is a metaphor of going back into the womb, swallowing the mother, not killing the father, could also be counterproductive. So what you want, you, you want to put whatever metaphors you want to put there as the thing not to do. Different. I'm not sure I'm exactly following on from what you said, but these are just some random thoughts that come to me now. That uh, I know Lacan thinks that the father is the first rival, and that the father, in fact, is always a rival. And therefore, there is a, a paradox that the father saves you from engulfment by the mother because the mother tends to be engulfing. She's the person you came from. If the father isn't strong enough to separate you from the mother, then indeed you become engulfed. You may become autistic, you may become schizophrenic. Not autistic, psychotic, more likely. Okay. Yeah. I mean, because Lacan spoke about paranoia rather than schizophrenia, there's a whole mm -hmm. complicated area of where <laughs> technology, uh, sorry, uh, uh, where uh, terminology becomes difficult. But let's say that the child could become too undifferentiated from the mother if the father isn't strong enough. And yet he is a rival. Yes. He's both of those. That's a kind of fascinating I mean, one that never really works that through. Because in the unconscious, <laughs> there, are, there are no contradiction. But yeah, the yeah, unconscious there are no, does not know negation. Yeah, there are no, no resolutions. It's only once it goes into the preconscious yeah. that things become uh, opposites. Yes. So, Love and hate in the unconscious are exactly the same. It's only Anything once it's deployed then. that yeah. love becomes love and then hate becomes hate. But then, on it takes this for your love to become hate. If you get dumped, for instance, <laughs> within, within a millisecond, when narcissism is uh, obstructed, love becomes hate. There are paradoxes in some dramas and films, aren't there? Where a destructive figure at the last moment becomes a saviour. Like at the end of the film Jurassic Park, T-Rex, no less, prevents the velociraptors from killing the kids. So the killer kills the killers. So this is some kind of inversion of a father figure upon what little That's redemption, demonstrative but uh, little uh, Where's your Christian concept of redemption? Yes, redemption. yes. Yes. Redemption is possible in Christianity. Yeah. Yes, yes, it is. Yes. Yes. So uh, by being able to use results and to redirect it onto semitic forms rather than falling on yourself. That's how you can also become creative. That's how you can build your civilizations. Because by dissolving existing synthetic forms, you also create new worlds. So that's acting on the imaginary and symbolic rather than acting on the real. But you know, Bruno, that civilization is like these little squiggles you've drawn between three, two, and one. Civilization is so weak. It's like, I don't know, it's difficult to find a word that really says how weak it is, but Freud certainly felt that civilization was skin deep. That the kind of primal man is, you know, always there. Yes, uh, but there is acting in the real, isn't there? Because there's the performing, there's the making. The no, 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 that's not acting in the real, that's in the imaginary and the symbolic. No, it's not. It's when, you're acting, when you're acting in the real, you pay with your body. Yeah. yeah. And you 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 are because and you're using your body. Yeah, and it's very I mean, painful. what about what about um, you know improvisation that you love? Yes, but that's imaginary. Let's take uh, let's take makeup for instance, makeup in theatre. That's acting on the body, but that's acting on the imaginary body. Uh, I do disagree. If you act on the real body, then you'll have real scars. And, you you, and your hand will be cut off on real are, instead of being a prop. If you're singing, you're in the real. No, you are in the imaginary and the symbolic if you're singing. You sing according to well, a certain code. Well, you're saying we're never, never, never in the real. Yes, you can be in the real. 
when you have performance anxiety just before being on stage, <coughs> you are in your real bed. Then you're in the real But you're improvising, you might do as well. Not all the time. Or what you might make into a feature. If you were <coughs> in which case you'd be acting, you'd uh, endeavor to act in the same way. Don't they, don't they come together in the, the event? Yes. In what the can calls the event. Which event? The event that uh, uh, there's, something, there's something that he calls the event, which is uh, which c crosses the uh, the symbolic and uh, the whole three together. But those two go together. They all go together. They all go together. We were two. You were fishing in there. So we were two together. You were fishing in there in the real. But, but you're always they're always together. They're really, aren't they? They're always. We could consider they are together, providing providing you need providing you have a fourth term which keeps them all three together. You need a fourth term to keep them. What about what's being recorded by your body in terms of you know, neuroscience? If it's, if it's recorded, it's an inscription. If it's an inscription, yeah. it's a signifier with some video. No problem. That is real. No. It's you, imaginary. You uh, what neuroscience is not. The signifier not. is imaginary. Yeah. I'm talking about what, you know, the but traces, what the trace, being exactly, recorded what, in your body. What Freud called the memory traces is what Lacan calls the signifier. And that's imaginary because it's there no, with a quantum of your video. body is doing the recording, yeah. it's not imaginary. It is. If it's turned into a signifier, it is imaginary. So if the signifier is imaginary, yeah. Why have you got it as a separate category? I don't. These are three circles with the names there. Yeah, but you've got but three, three orders. Three, three yeah. separate things. Yeah. One imaginary, one real. Yeah. One. There are three, three orders. Yeah. Three, three, three orders. orders or categories, yes. Mm -hmm. They can be kept together, providing there's a fourth term which links them together. But, but the signifier, is that different from the imaginary or not? The signifier. <laughs> <laughs> the character of a signifier is that it is imaginary. It belongs to the imaginary order. Uh -huh. What you say, what you think about yourself, about the world, or whatever, this is a fiction. It's imaginary. It's but the meaning is that the meaning, signifier yes. is imaginary, but the signifier is not imaginary. It is. Hallucinations of the service moment is weird. When you're having hallucinations, you're in the real. Can I just interject to that point and say that? I'm, I've read somewhere that Lacan considers the transference to be a phenomenon that alters both people. So actually you, you never find the meaning, and not really. You find bits of it, don't you? You never find the whole thing. So we, we needn't argue it's about it. It's, it's there, it's yeah, it's saying. there. Uh, a union B, <laughs> each mathematics does not consider that it transforms the element, but I consider that it does not so here. Yeah. So when we are interacting from our different disciplines, those yes. disciplines get uh, modified. There is yes. a reaction. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, if I may finish, and then we can really argue about the imaginary and the real one. <laughs> the drive, the drive is the big problem because the drive is always there. And remember, the dead drive is always silent, and the dead drive is always hovering. So, what do you do with it? You well, repeat it. You repeat it. You have actions that embody it because they are repetitive. They come to the same dead end every time. Or well, that's the, that's the dead drive itself. That's the behavior of the dead drive, which is something we saw this morning as well. Yeah. Yes, you catch it. 
and you deflect it onto semiotic constructions, i.e. on the imaginary, rather than let it act on the real. Except you can't deflect it 100% with no. always a remainder exactly. which falls back onto you. That's, right. That's why there is nothing else but a symptom. And this is a way to deal possibly with a symptom. And the death drive can be libidinized, and libido can form a lot of uh, drives in music. It can form relationships between keys. It can form the need to go from key number one to key five to key number one, or by the way, from key number one to key number three, or flattened key number three, or whatever, whatever alternative you want in the middle. Uh, when Beethoven goes to the flattened sixth step of the scale in that wonderful March passage in the finale of the Ninth Symphony, you could say that's libido. What is that? Something called something eight. There's the middle eight. Middle eight. The middle eight. The transition. The middle eight is, 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 a, is the section of eight bars in the middle of a pop song that's different in character and style to the opening tune and the tune you go back to. It doesn't need to be, but it often is. This is what you can do with music and the father. This is uh, our spring in Egypt. What we're doing is the drink from Kiko, please. Okay. Thank you. They're doing something with traditional education music, which we should going to explain in a moment, which is called Sharp Abbey. C H O A B I. Sharp What is Sharp Abbey? Well, it, it's normally a southern Iraq dance uh, with very different footsteps. The music's not that important in it. It's the really choreography which is more important. Okay, and what they're doing is they call it electro shabby. They're using shabby music, they've got computers and they remix live with DJs, they do all kinds of modifications and they use that as a gathering moment and place of both sexes. We're talking here about Muslim Egypt. Both sexes to discuss politics, ideas how to get rid of that tyrant, of that father? Because us, the young generations, the current generations, we want something else. We are not interested in having the same person for 40 years. We want a change. We have a different way, we have a different attitude. And they use music for that. Okay.